This is Drive, and I'm Jim Farley. There's one dumb little ritual where we have a little kind of group fist bump as I leave my office and head down to do the show, and everyone chants, best show ever, best show ever, which is, is really done sarcastically. You know? mm-hmm. But I always had this idea that if this thing was going to get canceled, it wasn't going to be because I didn't try as hard as I possibly can. My next guest is Jimmy Kimmel. And before I did this recording, I was wondering what we would have in common. This great late night, 19 years leader uh, in such a competitive space and a CEO at Ford. And I found out pretty quickly what it was. We're both competitive and we both want to do the very best job we can. Where, Where did that competitiveness come from you? I think maybe... I don't know if you're born, I think you might be born with that, but I I think certain things you're born with and then certain things are reinforced in your family. I was the oldest, which is part of it. I was the youngest one in my class. I was always a year Mm -hmm. behind everybody else. I was a pretty smart kid, pretty good student, loved sports because I was a year younger, wasn't the best athlete, but I was always right in there. And I still remember every one of my tiny little sports achievements. I'm, it's funny, the things you remember, <laughs> at first home run, I had like a really good baseball season, but I mm. wanted to hit a home run and I hadn't hit a home run. And my mom said, well, let me, I'm going to hypnotize you and you will <laughs> hit a home run. And so I laid down on like the, we had this little like kitchen area, this built-in banquette. I remember laying down and my mother's like, you imagine the ball, you the that you know as best as she could she didn't she didn't know much yep. about baseball um and i did and sure enough i hit a home run in the game i no guess it's just way. what like, real athletes do they visualize they mm-hmm. they think it through and i like to think things through i like to imagine where i will be on the other end of something whether it's like a big award show that i'm hosting i like i like to think about okay what do i want the outcome to be and it helps me figure out how to go about doing it i totally get that um so in that respect competing is really is really a self discovery it's kind of like getting the most out of you my wife and i she's executive producer of the show so we have a lot of conversations about I don't know that we try to work as hard or harder as anyone on the show. And I think that's, mm-hmm. that's a great place to start because if your leader isn't doing much, it's, it's hard to muster the energy to do it yourself. And, um, and I think that's important. I just remember getting a, uh, I had my appendix taken out and I, uh, it was, you know, emergency appendectomy and I was back to work the next morning and I, I didn't even take the day off and everybody at the show was so visibly bummed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they thought they were, were going to get oh, not only a oh. night off, but, a, an excuse to take a break occasionally themselves. But I just, you know, I, I've never missed the show. You know, I, I, I have to be there. I feel like it's it's weird because when I was in school, I never had that feeling. I never felt like uh, I can't. In fact, one day I I pretended to be sick because my favorite baseball player, Steve Garvey, was on the Mike Douglas show, and we didn't. It was before VCR, so there was. If I missed it, I missed it, and so I feigned illness just so I could stay home to watch TV. He was awesome. I could see that. I would, I would have the same thing on cars, but my dad was a banker, so he absolutely, I had to hide watching any kind of motorsports. If he came in the room, oh, what the hell is that? Uh, well, I'm watching the NASCAR race. <laughs> oh, Jesus, yeah, nah, nah, that's why you're going to yeah, school. Right. Turn the, that off. <laughs> the depreciation on cars, a banker is, has got to be very low. He wants it's see. very low. And he would always come back, he'd get his car from the local uh, dealer and the dealer would totally lie to him. Oh, this is Mr. Ford's personal Lincoln. And he would come home and he's like, uh, I got a great deal on this used Lincoln. And it was Mr. Ford's personal. It's an executive loaner. I'm like, dad, that is a crock of shit. You believe that? He's like, yeah, I was 14 and I, and, uh, I already knew the scam was happening, but my dad was totally all in. And I was like, hey, uh, I was, dad, you are such a sucker. He was, a, he was really a bad buyer. <laughs> 
My two. My dad thinks he's great at buying mm. cars. And maybe he is now. I don't really know. But when my dad bought me a car, he comes home and he comes and gets me. And he says, I want you to see something. And we go out to the driveway. And there is a um, silver Isuzu iMark. It's like 1985, you know? Know it well. Yeah. yeah. And um, which I'm thrilled, you know, I'd, I'd take anything at, at this point. But right next to it is another silver Isuzu iMark. And I said, why are there two of them? And my dad, you know, who never spent any money on anything, he said, the guy gave me a really good deal. And then I asked him, like, how much would it be if I got two of them? And so he got one for himself. So when I was a teenager, I was driving the same car as my dad, you know, and I, we, I'd walk out to the driveway and I'd have to, it'd take me a minute to figure out which one was mine. It was like a, being at a, <laughs> on a lot or something. So, uh, you know, following your career, um, you had to take a lot of road trips. Do oh, yeah. you have like a favorite car during all of those road trips? I would say, I, you know, I've loved almost every one of my cars. I had a, uh, a Mazda RX-7, 1981, had been hit by a UPS truck and smashed in the whole passenger side of the car. And um, I was in the car at the time, and the guy just backed into me and kept backing into me. And finally, he heard the horn and stopped. But I got the check for the car, and I had no money. And the car was still drivable, so I think I pocketed the $900. And I kept driving this car with the side smashed in. But we went on this. I was fired from a job in Seattle, radio station, first one I was paid to work at humiliated really uh lease was up in the house there were no prospects for jobs in seattle and so i decided i was going to move back in with my parents i rented a 26 foot long u-haul basically and i had the grand dam attached to the back of it okay. and it was loaded with our stuff now we took the drive from seattle to phoenix which is pretty good distance and i'm 21 years old i've never driven a really a truck ever and um i'm driving this thing and uh someone broke into it uh when we oh we stayed over in uh in in stockton california he broke into it and stole the lawnmower oh boy <laughs> that's the only thing the thieves wanted was a lawnmower <laughs> <laughs> and uh we got back in we drove we finally got to someplace in california where we're like four hours from Phoenix, the destination, and uh, I'm walking the dog at a rest stop, and this guy goes, hey, um, is that your truck? And I go, yeah, and he goes, it's moving. <laughs> I hadn't oh, set no. the emergency brake, and this truck oh, weighs obviously a lot. I mean, we're, you know, maybe like 8,000 pounds are now headed towards the, uh, the 10 freeway, and oh, it starts well, getting, and I try to get, I get my keys out of the pocket. I'm running alongside it. I've got a whole big keychain. I'm trying to get the key in the truck. I'm panicking. And finally, I'm, and I try to stop the truck physically with my body, which is ridiculous. No. And, no. and thank God it hits this big cement garbage structure and stops the truck. Otherwise, that thing would have, I don't know, it would have potentially killed people. There would have been uh, like a, a news caliber smash up on the 10 thanks to uh me not setting the emergency brake that is actually very it sounds like actually a pretty scary moment it was terrifying uh, yeah. yeah i remember my dad uh, was a big golfer and we had um a guy who would look after our lawn in connecticut and he he loved his car so much that he had plastic covering on all the seats nice so he parked his car at the same place my dad comes out he backs up his car, hits this guy's car. It is also not in uh, emergency brake. It rolls through our driveway, down the back of our property, through about 20 trees and lands in our next door neighbor's yard and doesn't touch anything. My dad didn't even notice. He drives off to golf. The guy's like, what the, you know, screaming at me. And it was unbelievable. It, we couldn't we couldn't have driven that car through all those trees and not hit anything. There should be a word for that when you realize you've left your car in gear yeah. and it's going. Yeah. So you went from, let me get this right. So you went from an Isuzu. Yeah. 
and then right to the RX-7? Yeah, there was a time where I had no car, which was terrible when I was living in Seattle, and I would just get a ride to work every day. And that was um, kind of humiliating. But then, yeah, in fact, the guy I worked with, my radio partner, he broke up with his girlfriend, and he bought her a car, and there was a whole thing where she was trying to steal the car, and he said, can you keep it at your house? And so I kept oh. it at my house, and I fell in love with it. I started repairing it. I bought that bought that Chilton manual as I fixed the radio. It was the first time and probably only time in my life that I had a car that needed to be fixed up and I could maybe do something about it. This is Drive. I'm Jim Farley and we'll be right back with Jimmy Kimmel. My name is Jim Farley, and this is Drive. Many years ago, I thought, why don't they take these classic cars that are so great and redo them in the same way that Hollywood does movies over? You know, it's like these, I, I don't know what the reason is. I don't know enough. Maybe it's just, it's, it would be a step backwards from a, an aerodynamic place or whatever, but I do feel like, and people are going back and collecting vinyl records now, and, and uh, there's something to that. And wouldn't it, boy, wouldn't it be great to have uh, you know, just a, a duplicate of one of these great vehicles from the past? You know, that's a good question because that is my passion. I've been buying and selling old cars my whole life, irregardless of which company I work for. I worked for Toyota for 25 years before I went to Ford, and it didn't matter. I always bought and sold old cars. You know, the bottom line is old cars are not safe. <laughs> they, right. they would never pass the safety requirements, even if we put 12 airbags in them. You know, the crash zones, the way they're engineered. Um, when, they, when they crash, it's no bueno. <laughs> I have a, a 74, I think, VW thing that I had converted to okay. electric. Mm -hmm. And yep. boy, is that not safe. I mean, that is, uh, I feel like I'm, I really do feel like I'm cheating death each time I, I pull into the driveway in that thing. Yeah, back then, things were really not safe. Like, I remember my dad, I don't know about yours, but my dad was like absolutely against wearing a seatbelt. I'm like, Dad, you have to wear your seatbelt. He's like, I don't care. I'm old enough. Jesus, I get thrown. You know, it's safer to be thrown out of the car. Yes. I'm like, Dad, it's not It's not safe at all. My Uncle Frank <laughs> used to say the same thing. It was his thing. It was like he did not want to wear the seatbelt because he felt it was unsafe. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. But it somehow worked for those guys. Yeah, they were also smoking uh, we in the car. And um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, my head went through the windshield of our our car when I was living in Brooklyn. I, and then we lived with that spider web on the, the windshield for the whole rest of the time we owned the car. We never got it repaired because I was sitting in the front seat. You know, imagine that the third front seat is a thing that you just don't see much anymore. Yeah. Yes, the middle seat. Yes. Do you have a favorite road uh, in, in Southern California or in LA that you like, cause there's some iconic like Angeles Crest and Mulholland. You got some great roads there. There are some great roads, but I'll tell you the spot I love the most is we have a house down at the beach in the South Bay and we go there on the weekends and there's a Manhattan beach Avenue. And when we pull over that street and we see the ocean for the first time after working all week, that is when I really feel like, Oh, I can breathe and, and I love that drive. My wife hates the drive. I love it because it, of what it represents. It represents taking a break for a couple of days or somewhat of a break. And um, that's, I think of, when I think of a, a drive that I love, that's it. I know exactly what you mean. You kind of come over that hill and suddenly there's the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, it's like, oh, there you are. You've been here the whole time. I forgot about you. Is that interesting? L.A., I found the same thing. Like, it is so beautiful at moments. And then there are other moments where you're like, this is, this is not beautiful. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. During the quarantine, when nobody was going anywhere and doing anything, it became so much more beautiful. And weirdly, mm -hmm. animals started coming out of places where you'd never seen mm -hmm. animals before. And it made me realize... The time during quarantine when you just saw how clear the air was and how beautiful everything seemed to be uh, makes you realize that you can make a difference in a short period of time. Totally. 
Uh, my wife and I talk about this all the time because in my role, I feel that pressure in a good way. Um, I think it's so important. That's one of the gifts that the West Coast of the U.S. got during COVID is to understand, you know, these choices we're making matter. Well, good. I'm glad that I'm glad to hear that. I think that the auto industry is, is going to be one of the leaders as far as that goes. And um, and it's it's nice to see that all these different um, fuel sources being developed. I mean, I really like that. Um, you know, I like to see American companies leading the way in that in that area. And um, electric cars are fun to drive. You can go fast and um, the big thing is getting, you get worried about those long road trips and whether you're going to make it and how long you have to sit at that charger or not. But, um, other, otherwise I have no complaints about them. Yeah. It's, it's, a. Uh, I would say, you know, as an old school car person, I would say it's a better car, 40% less parts. It breaks less. Uh, the interior package is much big. There's a lot more room because you don't have transmission tunnels and drive shafts and, um, you can move the whole HVAC, uh, all the cooling and heating in the front of the vehicle. So you literally get like a class above. There are a lot more, uh, a lot more roomy inside. The torque, as you said, is amazing. The, you use less brakes because you're regenerating the, the motor. So running them reverse, so to speak, um, helps you brake. So you use the brakes less. Um, the only thing I worry about a little bit, cars are still emotional thing so one thing i worry you know not worry but i'm i'm constantly discussing with my team is we can't just make these commodities yeah for sure i have a mini winnie the winnie winnebago and it's on a i think Mm -hmm. uh, a chassis of what an e450 i think Mm -hmm. Uh, and Mm -hmm. um, if if it was reasonable if the if the driving distance worked it would be the greatest thing ever to have that on a on an electric chassis. I mean, that would be, I, I think that would really be something. Well, I think, you know, how we look at it, cause we're, we're in Ford's number one in commercial. We have 50% of all commercial, you know, police cars, ambulances, uh, plumbers, electricians, we're, we're 50% of the market at Ford. We've, we've looked at the RV market really carefully on electrifying it. The bottom line is that when the vehicles get big enough and if they travel long enough, the batteries are so big and so heavy that they actually don't really work as well right now with the EV technology, like you said. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I would imagine that batteries will get smaller and smaller and hold more and more as the years go on. But yeah, right now, like that uh, Volkswagen thing I have, there, there's a lot of batteries in that car. You know, there's, and they're yeah. big. Well, the, the problem with high energy density batteries um, is fire. Ah. So, um, you know, the more energy density you have on a battery, then you know there's more and more risk and you can manage it but when you're building millions and millions of vehicles there are going to be some manufacturing flaws here and there what if you limit it to fire trucks to fire engines that way if it does catch fire they're more than equipped to put it out yeah good idea that's where you start that's a good idea creative thinking (laughs) i like it to me good um yeah so it is an exciting moment to be a leader and kind of like you you know in your business your business has changed so much and yet there you are yeah this we just celebrated or i don't know if celebrated is the right word we just marked 19 years on the air which is so crazy because there's not one of us and not only do we not think the show would go 19 years i was hoping it wouldn't there uh, there were times that? that first year where the second year third year where it was so brutal we were on the air live from 9 p.m to 10 p.m every night from la we're on at midnight new york the uh, whole day was was spent preparing for the show and we didn't have any of the infrastructure that we have now we didn't have regular guests we didn't even have a a strong booking team there were days where it was five o'clock p.m we were four hours away from the show and we didn't have a guest you know you can't do a talk show without a guest and um it was so stressful but i always had this kind of idea that i didn't want to disappoint anyone and if this thing was going to get canceled it wasn't going to be because i didn't try as hard as I possibly can and there was a long period of time where maybe we'd have one pretty good show in like two weeks and then you get to like 
you know, a good show every week and then maybe you have two good shows a week and then you get to the point where you're like consistent and all the shows are pretty good and maybe another maybe a show is great and that takes time and that takes effort every single day it's really a lot like playing sports you can't just sit there and expect that you'll still be good at it you have to work at it every single day and if I were to take two hours out of one day the impact on the show would be noticeable well I have no idea what that feels like but (laughs) um, one time I had the chance to go to SNL and see my cousin Chris Farley uh, perform for the first time and I remembered being in the audience and thinking how remarkable it was the moment it went live um, yeah. that as a viewer I never really understood until I was there live the skill and talent uh, that it takes to do that night after night must be amazing um, do you do you have a ritual before you go on yeah we have there's one dumb little ritual where um, we have a little kind of group fist bump as I leave my office and head down to do the show and everyone chants best show ever, best show ever, which is, is really done sarcastically, you know, but, Mm -hmm. but it's still, it's our ritual. We do it. I have a very regimented day. There's uh, not a minute that is unaccounted for. I eat through lunch. It's just, you know, we're trying to do a, a show that includes every major story up until the point I step on, on that stage. So, Sometimes we we're watching the news and we'll have a monologue almost completely planned out and we'll have to start from scratch because something big happens at, you know, three 30 and that happens a lot. And that's fun. It's, it's not something we look forward to. We always, when it happens, we're like, Oh no, <laughs> but it is fun to sit there and just power out a show. And I feel like I got that skill from being on the radio i was a sports guy at uh, kroq in la and i did six sports casts a morning so every half hour 6 a.m 6 30 7 a.m 7 30 8 8 30 and i wrote all the material for the show and i got good at writing fast and um that's a skill that is only useful in like kind of daily live radio or television but man if you need a joke in like um 90 seconds i'm i'm your guy (laughs) and and i always say like 90 percent is good enough that's my that's always my motto because i find that you have to spread the time around and if you waste too much you get precious and you use all your time that day on one little thing it's going to make everything else suffer you know, I um, I have to say this because you're such a pro and now having that insight and in how much hard work goes into your show, there was a moment um, that really impacted our family in a positive way from your show that was unplanned in a way. Um, so we had a personal tragedy in our family. I won't go into it. But there was a moment when you went and talked about your child and their heart issue, and you really spoke in a way that I had never really heard from someone in your position. And it was, I think we're all kind of touched with things that surprise us that aren't our fault, um, that sometimes have really big impact on our life. And it was such a touching moment. Uh, and I, I, I just wanted to, in a way, thank you uh, for expressing yourself as a father uh, about your child um, because it really resonated with my wife and I. Well, thank you for saying that, and I'm sorry about um, what what you went mm. There's one thing that I figured out, and I figured it out in a kind of a silly way. I um, <laughs> When I was working at a radio station in Palm Springs, I ran out of gas for the first and only time in my life, but... It run it ran out. I'm stuck on the side of the road. It was before work, and I was on the way to the to do the show. It was a problem, and we didn't have a cell phone or anything. And it was just a huge pain in the ass. And uh, I got to work, and I started talking about it. I'm on the air. I'm doing a morning radio show, and it was funny. And I was telling the whole story. And at the end, I thought, well, you know what? I wonder now, after having that 
funny piece of material. I wonder if I would go back, if I could go back in time, would I see to it that I yeah. didn't run out of gas? And I had to say yeah. the answer was no, I wouldn't because I feel like I got more out of it. And it mm. taught me a lesson that when you're a comedian, especially doing a show like I do, when something bad happens to you, you get something good from it if you if you spin it in the in the right way and so all these things that happen to me that you know your kid keeps you up all night throwing up or whatever it is I, I get something good out of it and that's really just a great dynamic to have in your life and um you know with my son being in the hospital I was I was uh, eager to make it into something positive because it was so scary and so uh, just yeah. terrifying yeah i mean you know it's 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 yeah. the it's the worst thing it's it can destroy whole families something like that and so um i looked around in the hospital uh and i saw what was happening there and how exceptional the people there were and uh, you know you start feeling like oh what these people do is important what i do is nonsense yeah. but one thing i did know is that i had a a story to tell and it just so happened to be when um our healthcare system was being challenged and um i'm not necessarily a person that believes things happen for a reason but if they do that was one of them and um the the timing was um interesting and almost miraculous in some ways as far as um this happening to my son right before there was a vote on on health care and um you know, just looking around and seeing pe these parents from all different economic backgrounds suffering. And I just knew that it didn't matter whether you were a Republican or a Democrat. I just knew that if you were in that situation, you would want to do everything you can to help those families and those children. And I still believe that. And I think it's so unfortunate that this has become um, there's a it's become divisive because I don't think America, I think Americans do agree on this. And I knew there would be a lot of attention on the situation I'd been in. And even like years to this day, I mean, every day, God bless him. Somebody comes up to me and says, how's your son? It happened to me yesterday, three times. Mm -hmm. How's your son? And I'm always so glad to be able to say he's doing well. He still needs another open heart surgery, but it's, it's very positive, the prognosis, and he's a normal kid. Well, he's as normal as a Kimmel kid can be, and uh, but physically he's normal. And um, I hear from a lot of parents, and uh, I, I'm uh, always eager to discuss this with them and to learn what they've learned and to share whatever I learned along the way uh, through this experience because you do learn, and mostly what you learn is that a lot of people care. Yeah. It was such a gift to all of us. Um, we are all touched by things uh, that are unexpected. My, my younger brother lived in the hospital for a long time, and those hospital workers are our most cherished people in our family because because exactly what you said. Um, well, I, I would love to uh, show you Ford. I know you're sponsored by Mercedes, but um, and they have some great technology, but uh, we have a lot of interesting things. Yeah, well, I... Um it was fun uh, chatting with you. And um, um, by the way, if you want to keep talking, I'm I'm happy to. But I feel as if you're winding down. And as a host, you have to know how to go to commercial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got it. That's it. Right. Well, thank you so much for the time. It was such a treat, and uh, all the best. Good talking to you. Thanks. Drive is produced by Jesse Baker and Eric Newsom of Magnificent Noise for Spotify. Chris Curtin is consulting producer. Our production staff includes Julia Na and Eva Walchover, with help from Lori Arpin, Jeff Nelson, Josh Malofsky, Darnell Macon, and Mark Truby. Special thanks to Liz Kellogg and Matt Lieber. Jim Farley is the host, and this is Drive. <laughs>